Hello and welcome to Midlander Gaming and today's episode is going to be me learning to play Waterloo Epic. Now there's quite a lot to the game, quite a lot of pages of the rules um, and quite a lot to learn so this is going to be broke down in multiple episodes um, pretty much going through the order of the book uh, and covering most phases, well every single phase and most rules. I'm not going to do every single rule because there's a lot in the book so I'd recommend always reading the book to get a full understanding of it and likewise I am literally learning this as I film so I have no uh, experience in the game um, I have read the book a couple of times but I will be pretty much learning the game by playing out each phase on camera and hopefully this will help me learn by doing it physically as well as reading the book but anyone out there who hasn't read the book or is reading the book as we speak and hasn't played a game yet, hopefully it will help you guys out as well. Now, like I said, I'm no expert. I've never played the game before. So this isn't a tutorial as such, more a let's learn to play together. So with that uh, detail out of the way, let's get on to the first section, which is from page six of the book which I will just briefly show you here and it is essentially what does an army look like most importantly what does a brigade look like so that what sh that's the what the book shows you um, with the army general in the center and then you have four brigades led by four brigade commanders as I don't have that much painted yet what I have in front of me here is what could be classed as one of the brigades of an army with three battalions of infantry and the brigade commander. Um, these are two normal line infantry and some light company or light infantry as well. So that is the format of a brigade. It's a group of units led by a brigade commander. Now what I said, I don't know if you've seen the video I, I read through the book or gave a brief overview of the book in one of my previous videos. What I've noticed is that the brigade commanders, while being a lower level leader than the general, these it's these guys that you get to use all the rules and staff abilities of. So if you have any special characters or pay points for any brigade commanders, use them as a brigade commander. Never ever pay or use a general or a special character as an army general because the only thing an army general will do is give you a re-roll you can't use his staff value and you can't use any of his special rules so when it comes to pick choosing points for a general always use the bog standard zero pointer that's my with a few reads of the book that's that's my main takeaway if you want to use napoleon or wellington or blucher or any of the other guys use them as brigade commanders because you get their full staff ability and all their special rules and they can uh, influence a brigade with that little detail out the way let's go on to what does a unit look like you know how does it perform so each guy each stand or each unit of people uh, they'll have a name to that unit so British line infantry for, ex for example here and they'll have five stats as such the first one being how many bases there are in a standard unit so here we can see four bases the next stat in fact I'll just show you a quick zoom in of the page so there we are four infantry it tells you the name of the unit type of the unit what they're armed with is a smoothbore musket this lets you know how what, essentially what the range is of their rifles whatever their rifles are that they're armed with the smoothbore musket is essentially a a range identif identification it shows you their hand-to-hand -hand combat value and that's how many dice they roll in combat so this unit four he'll roll six dice shows you how many dice they roll at shooting so three dice for those shows you their morale value now the morale value is if you're coming from other games like me think of it as an armor save so the lower the better um, you need to beat that number to save against damage taken now in this game obviously it's about keeping the morale of your, your troops 
alive you, you know essentially they don't have armor so you can't call anything an armor save but it's how easily they're going to be influenced by people dropping down dead or all around them so that's that's that value there and then the stamina is how many people once you failed that morale so how many casualties can you suffer before the unit becomes shaken um, so that's an overview of the unit now they all have various special rules as well which I won't go into um, it's a, not, especially not in this video maybe a later one um, but there are many many advanced and special rules in the game which give each unit their own flavor so as you can see there's not many stats so quite a lot of different racial units could be quite similar if it wasn't for the fact of all of these special rules making each one more unique and especially more in keeping with whatever uh, country they're from essentially so that is a unit and that is a brigade there that's the uh, the first look at the uh, the game so we've just gone over the basics of a unit and a brigade there and let's delve into a little bit deeper of the unit itself now each unit will actually have a unit leader uh, for some reason mine's not on the end there generally they should be kept as central as possible the unit leader will normally be identifiable by some kind of maybe a banner man or a officer or as in this case it's got officers drummers and banner men on and focus it in so that is the unit's leader now while that lead that particular stand doesn't have any stats um, from what i can tell you never remove stands from the board so it doesn't matter too much um about what the stands look like and, and which ones you use as the leader as long as you can identify them um obviously it's generally the models are give you that ability um so they don't have any in, any stats in particular to that stand but what they do have is when you do formations or do measurements and line of sights and things like that it's all taken from the position of the unit leader so that where that's where they come into their um, importance and we'll go over that a bit more when we get to formations um, so that is the units in, in essentially themselves now we talked about here it been a standard size unit of four bases now you can actually if I zip this one away pay for smaller units or larger units in the army list now what that will do is adjust your stats that we talked about earlier which are these stats here and by adding or removing a base will adjust these so adding or removing a base will adjust hand-to-hand -hand combat by two so a six would become an eight or a four it will adjust shooting by one so that will become a four or a two and it will adjust stamina by one so that will be a four or a two as well so when you adjust a base it's plus or minus two plus or minus one plus or minus one and that's a nice easy way of doing it. i think personally i'll be creating some kind of a chart or quick reference but that that is what the effect is of increasing or decreasing a unit and generally that's about adding or decreasing the unit's cost by eight points but it depends on the unit so we've gone over that um what we'll go on to now is talking about formations that is pretty much the, all the stats discussed on the models um so we'll move on to formations and the formations are covered on pages 12 and 13 and so on and so forth but essentially you've got for all the units have the ability to go into certain formations and this will be discussed in their rules the special rules i, I showed you listed underneath the unit um, but some typical formations that they can do is for infantry line formation and this allows you to use their normal stats as it is in their book um, but what they can also do 
is go in things called attack column which is simply essentially too wide too deep and that will adjust their stats so it's be very you have to be very careful on when you adjust formation you won't be attacking at their full potential because obviously people are behind them you will also be you will also suffer damage in, in an increased effect as well for example cannons will get bonuses because they're shooting through multiple rows of men rather than a very thin lines um, but also in things like a march column which is something like that when you're giving out commands which we'll go over shortly um, they're easier to give a command of marching to a formation in a march column because they're in position to march and, and are easier to maneuver than a large drawn out line so you get bonuses to your command values to, to, to move infantry when in this position um, you have other formations such as skirmish where they're one inch apart and this allows you to have 360 degree shooting ability um, and I believe you might be able to I can't, can't quite recall I've not read it enough but you might be able to measure choose which one's going to be the leader for the purposes of measuring from um, and then we have mixed order which is where you've got two joined and two skirmishing bases something like that which gives you a bit of a, a benefit to um, not quite as good as line infantry but not quite as good as skirmish either it's a bit of a does a bit of everything i guess and a final main infantry we'll talk about is square formation and this is particularly useful when defending against cavalry so those are the um i'm, I'm whizzing through um I, I, I don't want to there's lots of text in the book and and it would take a long video to to read it word for word so i'm just whizzing through and just giving some of the basics so that's those are the type of formations that you can um have your infantries in so and whenever you do a formation generally you keep your leader in the set in the center of it and form them up around that leader okay so there we discussed individual formations that or rather a formation that an individual unit can can uh, put itself in but then we've got the whole brigade and what is the interactions between the full brigade as well now technically the, there's no formation required however if you are within six inches of each individual battalion so six inches in between there six inches in between their maximum or to the sides um, then you, there are bonuses when your commander gives out um, orders you can do things like a an order that affects the whole brigade but they have to be within that tight knitting um, range for that to happen so you might not want that you might want the flexibility of moving some infantry off um, in that which case the brigade commander may have to give individual units to each um, battalion in that brigade uh, so it gives you that flexibility however the first time that the brigade commander fails given a command that's it he can't give any more commands so it's very that you have to weigh up the flexibility of individual orders over the certainty of just giving a, a, a bulk order to the whole unit and getting them to move now there's other bonuses to to ranges for the brigade and that's if this guy is too far away from the brigade i think but over 12 inches he reduces his staff order value by one um, tactics rate in or his general ability but whichever one you want to call it by one so and that i think happens for every 12 inches he's he's away from that unit he's given an order to so there's a benefit to keep giving him keeping him as close as possible um, in more ways than one so there we've had a quick overview of 
a unit, the brigade and their interactions. So we'll move on to how do you play the game. So the game is obviously over a number of uh, phases, like most games. Um, for this particular game, there's a command phase, a shoot phase and a hand to hand phase. That's the game order. In the command phase, as you can imagine, your brigade commanders issue all their commands to the units. Generally, those units then move or change formation or whatever that order was in that command phase. Then once you've done all your brigade commanders and all the commands that they wanted to order, after all the movements happened, you then do the shooting, all your units shoot. And then once all the shooting is over, you go into hand to hand and both armies fight in hand to hand. So you and your opponent. So that's a brief overview of the game order. Now, obviously there's little sub sections to that, like morale checks and being shaken and checking for victory. Um, but those are uh, the main key phases to the game. Now, units don't need to receive an order to shoot. So when you are giving out orders, we are talking about changing into a certain formation or moving into a location, uh, marching, advancing, charging, whatever it may be. But as long as they finish within re the range of their specified weapon, they will automatically shoot. So you don't need to give them an order to shoot. The uh, soldiers obviously use their own initiative. So just a brief talk about orders. Um, the orders you give have to be a clear indication of what you want the unit to do. And you issue your order before rolling the dice. Now, we've not really gone on to how orders work yet, but essentially um, he's got a value. You'll roll some dice and whatever you beat it by is how many orders you get, roughly speaking. Which means if this unit needs needs to move three times to be in range to shoot, you need to say something along the lines of advance as far as you can, and then when in range, um, open fire. You don't even need to say open fire because once they're in range, they will automatically shoot anyway. Now, the problem with that is that when you roll your dice and you don't get enough uh, orders, you only get two orders out of the three required, for example, they will only move twice because that's what you told them to to do and they will find themselves out of range of shooting you can't change your mind because you've already given them the order and they're now going to carry it out to their best ability so you really need to th consider what order you're going, going to give make it very very clear before rolling the dice so your opponent knows exactly what you're going to do and these guys will carry it out to the letter as much as they can and as directly as possible so you need to be very confident if if you're you need to move quite far or you need to change formation and then move you need to be very confident you'll get enough orders from your role now obviously the the better the leadership ability of this guy the more likely you are to achieve it and there's some special orders also to uh, sorry special rules to help you pass orders for example being in a march column low or uh, formation means you have a plus one to pass movement orders so on and so forth so it's very important the order phase i think probably from what i can tell it's going to be the critical phase getting off the orders you need getting your troops into positions you want them to in the in the um in the order that you want them to 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 carry out your master plan i guess um so that is going to be key to a successful uh, attack or defense or successful victory shall we say okay so let's go into what an order or what a command test actually consists of so we didn't really discuss it earlier but generally a command or a brigade commander or all your commanders generals will have a staff rating from five to ten ten being the best five being the worst well four or less as well but I don't think they're really staff ratings or leaders at that point. So that's their command rating. I think generally you're looking at um, seven, eight, nine is probably the most uh, 
common staff ratings. So that's what you're going to be looking at generally. Uh, you, to get to a 10, you're looking at Bonaparte himself and very, very key leaders. Um, generally, most generals are going to be around a 7 or an 8, possibly a 9. So what does a command test consist of? When you give your orders to your unit, advance twice and change formation or change into a march formation and then advance, whatever it may be. After giving the, for the order, you're going to roll two dice and you're going to compare the dice roll to the staff rating of your general or your brigade commander, sorry, and whatever you roll compared to that value is how many orders you issue. So let's do an example. Let's say his staff rating is an 8. Let's roll at some dice. There we have an 8. So as it matches the staff rating, that means we are successful in our uh, command. And we are able to have one order. We can carry out one order because we have rolled the same or one less. So if I'd have rolled a seven, for example, on his command of eight, we still could only do one order. If we roll a let's get it a six, which is two less than his command value of eight, then we would have been able to carry out two orders. For example, one change of formation, then a, then a move, or maybe a move and then a change of formation. Uh, as, as you, you know, or two moves, whatever it may be. And then if we are three or less, so we got a five with his command value of eight, we could have carried out three orders. So three moves, one change of formation and two moves or any combination. So that is essentially how commands work. If we roll higher than his command value of eight, so where are where's the four, there we are, and we will roll a nine, that means the command value, command order, or the command test has failed, and he can no longer issue out any more orders. Um, now, that's in a nutshell how to do a command test, what's involved. Um, there are some extra things to consider. For example, what's something that's called a blunder? So if you roll a double six. You've not, you, you, not only have you failed your order because no one has a the command value of 12 or a staff rating of 12, you've failed it so catastrophically that something bad is going to happen. Now, I'm not going to go over that in this video, but there's a table giving you a list of um, scenarios that happens from that blunder. OK, but as we saw, we actually got a pass. So we received a command value of 8 or we rolled an eight. His staff rating was an eight, so we could carry out one order. Now you can only attempt one order per unit, even if they fail. So I passed this, but I only got one order. So I can't roll again for this unit because I've, I've already rolled once. If I'd have failed it, I still couldn't roll again. Um, and now, and brigade commanders, issuing orders can only issue to their brigade as well. So he came with these three line infantry, so he can only issue orders to these line infantry. When you want to move on to a different brigade um, of different units, for example, maybe we had some divisional artillery as well, we'd have to do all these orders before moving on to the next brigade commander. So you have to be very careful about which order you're going to start issuing orders, which brigade commander you use first, because you're going to have to do all of his orders and all of his brigade before moving on. And also, like I said before, if he fails an order, you can't give any more orders. So that might be why sometimes you might want to just do a blanket order of, of directing the whole brigade in one go with just one test, um, because you're less likely to, to fail rather than rolling multiple tests. Um, and more likely to move the entire unit. Now, the only caveat to failing is we talked about briefly earlier that you get a general. If that general 
is within 12 inches of the brigade commander, it can allow him to re-roll one of his commands. Now that can only happen once, um, but that is the ability of the army general being nearby. And it means he can then have, may possibly avoid a blunder or potentially he, he may have passed his command, but you only got one order like that and you wanted, you needed to do two or three to carry out the, uh, the command that you really wanted. So you can use that general re-roll to even re-roll past tests as well. Um, and that is essentially all this guy does, which is why you want to keep him a 0 0.7 staff rating army commander never use a, a character or a, or someone expensive you know any special characters or pay any points for any army generals commanding chiefs divisional commanders anything like that just use the bog standard one because all he does is a give a re-roll so it doesn't matter what level you you choose your, your brigade commanders is where you want to sink all your points So we've talked about so far that you can pass command checks and issue orders to your brigades, they being movement orders or formation changes. The other types of orders or things that can happen in the command phase are initiative orders, free moves, follow me's and rallies. These are four other um, slightly out of sequence commands or commands that happen in another way. So going through in order, um, the initiative orders. These are orders that units can do acting on their own initiative. They don't necessarily need a command to carry out. It just happens automatically. Um, the first one is essentially if enemy are within 12 inches, you can get a free move or a free formation change. This is obviously um, the soldiers using their common sense that you know the, the enemy is so close that they don't actually necessarily need to be told what to do. They will do one of those items. No order for this is required. It can all just happen automatically, and it can happen before regular orders. In fact, they they do happen before regular orders. The next command that can happen is free moves. Um, and it's, this is essentially, it, I believe even on failed orders, a, a unit can still do a free move subject to some criteria. And I think it's being in certain formations. Uh, and it's essentially you can move once as a free move in if you're in a certain formation. Things like march, and uh, I think attack formation. You get you, even on a failed order, you'd still be able to get a free move. So move once. So there's two orders or moves that can carry out be carried out without a command test, um, acting on initiative, and a free move from failed orders, um, as long as you're in the correct formation. Two other orders that can be carried out um, that aren't related to movements and formations um, as such. Uh, While well, this first one is a, a move technically, um, is follow me and rally. So follow me is um, an order that you would give and it's, can, it's got to be the last order that can be given. So if a brigade commander gives a follow me order he can't give any further orders after this um, it's always the last order given the follow me allows the follow me order um, is given to one unit within 12 inches of the brigade commander um, if it's if the command test is failed no moves occur however if it is passed the commander becomes part of that unit and then the commander and that unit move three moves. So obviously this is a good order where you where a unit 
definitely needs to move three times. It's a good order to use to be able to uh, be almost guaranteed to achieve that three move order. However, you're obviously putting your brigade commander in that unit and as it's the last unit he can have, he can actually give, sorry, it's, it's the last order he can give, you need to be either uh, risk giving all your commands out beforehand and hope that you still have enough left or that he doesn't fail an order leading up to this follow me order so he can still give this order and, and pass it or you do the follow me order because you really really need it but then it has to be the last order therefore you waste any other chances of orders you can give so it's it's a it's potentially situational but where you really need a unit to move three times this is the order you want to to use the final order is the rally order now this order as you can imagine by the by the name of it is an order you give to rally your troops bolster them get them uh, motivated so on and so forth and you use this order to essentially remove casualty markers so we talked earlier about a unit has a stamina value and once that stamina value or sorry once the amount of casualty markers meets that stamina value they become shaken if you pass a rally order you can remove one casualty marker you can never remove the last casualty marker so when a unit is taking damage it will always have as a minimum of one casualty marker no matter how many rallies you do um, but obviously removing a casualty marker means you can change a unit from being shaken to no longer being shaken um, and there is negative aspects to being shaken um, which we'll go over later on um, so yeah it's a it's a very key order to give the rally order to make sure your units stay in the fight however just like follow me it's the last order a brigade commander can give so once again you have to think about the timing of giving this order do you want to give orders before it and risk not being able to carry out the rally order because you fail at a previous command or do you really need to rally a unit therefore you do it straight away but unfortunately it's the last order so we can't give out any other orders and the rest of the unit or the rest of the brigade are sitting around doing nothing remember you do get free moves so you might find yourself in a situation where you your other troops can act on their own initiative and therefore you can concentrate on giving your rally orders out instead and it, it's not essential because you know your troops are going to act on initiative with their free moves or um because enemy within 12 inches so it's a lot to think about um, but that is the rally order and that's given on a unit within 12 inches of brigade commander to remove one casualty marker so obviously we discussed movement orders in the command phase um, and when you pass a command you can move a unit now and that's moved one two or three times what we didn't discuss was how far a unit can move and there's a nice handy chart on page 32 which shows you that infantry and limbered, limbered foot artillery and wagons can move 12 inches cavalry and limbered horse artillery can move 18 inches and manned handled artillery can move six inches now i'm not playing a game yet i don't see I don't know how that stacks up but what I did notice is that these guys can move 12 inches per move which seems pretty fast so I think this game is actually going to be quite quite speedy um, quite maneuverable bearing in mind these guys if you pass a correct command or do a follow me can move three times so that's 36 inches these guys could move on a follow me or with three commands and even with two commands it's 24 inches that's half the board so they are it's it does actually despite being quite small scale it does seem like it'll be quite a fast paced um maneuverable game but obviously that also depends on passing commands so we'll see um now there are some uh exceptions to the rules of movement um, you can't just simply move around wherever you want and that is the proximity rule 
So as soon as, let's say, these green guys are enemy, as soon as you arrive within 12 inches of an enemy, like so, the only moves these guys could now do is either directly towards that enemy or directly away from that enemy. They're 12 inches uh, or their movement value. That is the only thing you can do once within 12 inches of an enemy. Um, now that's obviously if you want to move on I would assume you can hold and fire um, that would probably be, need to be a command check though because as we discussed earlier on initiative moves if the enemy are within 12 inches they will advance into them um, just double check over my notes I believe that's what is the case so yeah just catching up on the notes if the enemy were within 12 inches you do get a free move or formation change um, so that move obviously being within 12 inches would either need to be directly to the enemy or directly away or you could do a formation change perhaps maybe you were in uh, a column formation when the enemy moved within 12 inches as a free formation change you could actually do go into line and then you shoot automatically so then you shoot at full effect so I think there's a lot to learn, I think, on, on the way the moves work, um, all the commands. And I think it's going to, on paper, it doesn't look like there's a lot to it. You know, there's not too many commands and, and things you can do. But I think in reality, once you start playing a game and you think of all the possible scenarios and, and options you have, I think it will actually be quite tricky to choose the, the correct tactic for that scenario um, which is good that's exactly how a game should be you should, you should have lots of options and not know which is the the best route to take um, there should always be pros and cons to each option um, that was, I think that's what makes a good game so we'll see hopefully that's how it appears to me anyway so hopefully that will come true in a game when we finally get around to having one the final movement is moving commanders so we've talked about all the units and how they move and how far they can move. But these guys, uh, moving over, these guys, the Brigade Commanders and the Armour General, they can obviously move as well. So these guys move after all the orders are issued. Now, one thing I discussed earlier is that if a General is nearby, they can give these guys a reroll. To achieve that, you need to be there when these guys are given commands. But that guy only moves after commands. So you must have, say, say this guy's the general, you'd have had to move in range the previous turn to make sure you give that guy a reroll. So that's going to be very important to consider that where you need these guys, when you move these guys, basically, it's where you think you're going to need them for next turn. And I think that is going to be a key skill as well, making sure you get the brigade commanders in the right location for next turn. Now, probably you, you know where you need them because as, as he's issued all these commands, these guys will have all moved away and he's probably left flounderings way back there. So you're probably just going to move up to catch up with your your brigade. Um, but it is something to, to consider. Now, luckily... The brigade commanders can move pretty far so I think in general you shouldn't be left behind um, but if we go to one thing I did notice which could be future proofing so here's the commander moves on foot 36 inches and on horseback 48 inches I've not actually seen any brigade commander that isn't on a horse so in essence they're all 48 inches I've also not seen any option to give or not give a horse to a brigade commander. So I think that might be a legacy order from a, the previous rule set of what this is based on. Um, because it, so far in Epic Waterloo, I've not seen a, a commander on foot. However, the stat is there. Um, I think it'd be quite cool that maybe a brigade commander could become unhorsed and then he's trying to run around, <laughs> possibly. Um, maybe that's a nice house rule, you know, because commanders can get in combat if they join a unit for example with a follow me they can then get hurt otherwise they can't be targeted um so that might be potentially a fun house rule that 
when in when in a unit there's a got a chance of being unhorsed but anyway that's not an actual rule um so as such pretty much you may as well just use the fact that all commanders on horseback have a 48 inch range for movement and that is it really for we've kind of discussed what an army looks like the statistics of an army uh, of a unit the orders that can be given so movement formation changes initiative orders follow me orders rally orders and um, proximity of 12 inches orders and we've then discussed how to take command checks rolling two dice and below the staff value and the way they interact and work with each other you know ranges and so on and so forth movement ranges and i think that's it for for the first section i think that's quite a few minutes and uh, i'll probably bored you to tears already so we'll leave it there and on the next episode we move on to the fun part of the game and that's shooting so where all the noise the smoke the fear and death i think well apart from hand to hand i suppose but i think uh, it's a big section so i think the next video will be just shooting alone we won't do more than one section um but yeah so if you enjoy going through the book like this yeah maybe think about subscribing and then you'll catch any future updates um but thanks for taking the time to listen to this and i'll catch you on the next episode bye bye for now